everyone, and welcome to the fourth webinar in our series. My name is Anuth Naushan, Project Manager of Courage to Act. Courage to Act is a two-year national initiative to address and prevent gender-based violence on post-secondary campuses in Canada. It builds on the key recommendations within Possibility Seeds' vital report, Courage to Act, developing a national framework to prevent and address gender-based violence at post-secondary institutions. Our project is the first national collaborative of its kind to bring together experts and advocates from across Canada to end gender-based violence on campus. A key feature of our project is our webinar series, where we invite leading experts to discuss key concepts and share promising practices on ending gender-based violence on campus. Supported by Caucus, these webinars are also a recognized learning opportunity. Attendance at 10 or more live webinars will count towards an online certificate. And we begin today's webinar by acknowledging that this work is taking place on and across the traditional territories of many Indigenous nations. We recognize that gender-based violence is one form of violence caused by colonization to marginalize and dispossess Indigenous peoples from their lands and their waters. Our project strives to honor this truth as we work towards decolonizing this work and actualizing justice for missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls across the country. I note too that our project is made possible through generous support and funding from the Department for Women and Gender Equality Wage, Federal Government of Canada. And before we begin, I want to pause now and invite everyone to take a deep breath. This work can be challenging and this topic hard. Many of us may have our own experience of survivorship and of supporting those we love and care about who have experienced gender-based violence. A gentle reminder here to be attentive to our own well-being as we engage these hard conversations. And before I introduce our speakers today, a brief note on the format. Chantelle, Priya, Kat and Trina will speak for 40 minutes and I invite you to enter questions and comments into the question and answer box and I will monitor this and together we will pose these questions to them at the end of the presentation. This will happen the last 15 minutes of the presentation. And at the end of the webinar, you will find a link to the evaluation form. We'd be really grateful if you take a few minutes to share your feedback as it helps us improve. This is anonymous. Following the webinar, I will also email you with a copy of the evaluation form and a link to the recording so you can review the webinar and share with your networks. And now I'd like to introduce our speakers today. Chantelle Spicer is an advocacy coordinator at Students for Consent Culture Canada. She holds a degree in Indigenous Studies and Anthropology from Vancouver Island University and is currently undertaking a master's degree in Anthropology at Simon Fraser University. Her foundations in anti-violence work lie in fighting for Indigenous sovereignty, solidarity and community accountability. She has worked with organizations such as West Coast Leaf, the BC Federation of Students, the Teaching Support Staff Union, the Nanaimo Women's Center, and Downtown Eastside Women's Center. She's passionate about advocating for institutional accountability and centering the experiences of communities marginalized by historical and ongoing colonial systems to end violence. She resides in the traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil Waututh nations. Thank you, Chantal. Priya Dube supported the development of the Student Union's Gender and Sexual Violence Policy as a student at McGill. After graduating, Priya worked for the Canadian Alliance of Student Associations, where she participated in the development of the national framework to combat sexual violence on Canadian campuses. Outside of work in school, Priya volunteers with LEAF as a public educator, offering workshops on knowing your rights at work to high school students in Ottawa. Thanks, Priya. And Catherine Dunn is finishing up her term as the president of the Ontario Undergraduate Student Alliance and as a vice president of Western University Student Council. She initially got involved in student government following her time as a, resident, as a residence advisor, where she supported survivors in navigating residence gender-based violence policies, advocating for increasing funding for gender-based violence prevention and response efforts, and for survivor-centric legislation and policies have been her top priorities throughout her term. Thank you, Kat. And Trina James is a former treasurer for the Canadian Federation of Students. She recently completed a double major in political science and women and gender studies at the University of Toronto Scarborough campus. 
Her experience within the student movement began in 2015, where she served her first of two terms as the Vice President of Campus Life for Local 99, the Scarborough Campus Students' Union, and one term as CFS Ontario Treasurer. It was through this work that she learned the importance of creating events through an anti-oppressive framework that were accessible, entertaining, and empowering to members. Throughout her work, Trina strives to fight for a post-secondary education system that is, that is accessible to all students. It's my pleasure now to turn it over to our wonderful student experts. Good morning, everybody. Um, I wanna start off by saying thank you so much for being here today. Um, as you'll hear from my presentation and the presentation of my comrades here, it is really a gift to have people listen to student voices talk from their positions of expertise on ending gender-based violence on our campuses. What I'm going to be talking to you about specifically today is the consultation process itself, um, what it's meant for the organization that I work for, which is Students for Consent Culture Canada, and um, what this could mean moving forward. So a little bit about myself. Um, so as Anuth had stated, I come from a background that is really solidly positioned within Indigenous solidarity movements. I've also been really lucky to have been taken under the wing of many movements throughout my life, including the labor movement. Um, and this really positioned me for coming into post-secondary education as a mature student to place this as a very political identity. Um, and I really hit the ground running um, and was the chair of my students union and also the women's representative for my provincial student federation, the BC Federation of Students. I am now currently the advocacy coordinator of Students for Consent Culture Canada and also the commissioner of the Solidarity and Social Justice Committee committee of my labor union as a grad student worker um, and I just want to say before I start this that it is from a multitude of communities and knowledges that I'm able to bring this information that I'm presenting to you forward today so this is not just me speaking for myself but from a lifetime of um, coming to know many different knowledges so I'm very grateful for that as well so in terms of the organization that I work for, which is Students for Consent Culture Canada, we are the only national student-led organization um, that is working towards ending gender-based violence on our campuses. We work in collaboration, obviously, with many student-led organizations that are allied with us in this work. And we have a foundation of supporting intersectional, anti-colonial, and grassroots anti-violence advocacy on on uh, campuses all across Canada. And just a portion of our work deals with consultation and also includes education and advocacy and outreach as well. And you, you will find that our organization's history is deeply entwined with the consultation processes and our desire for meaningful and accountable processes. So on the next slide, you'll see um, photos from what this history looks like. So in 2013, a very high profile sexualized violence case at McGill University pushed student voices forward who had been calling for the creation of a sexualized violence policy for years, for, for decades actually. Um, at this time, the Dean of Students responded to these raised student voices by saying that if such a policy was desired, the students could create one themselves. And so they did with students in the student run sexualized violence support center working to do just that. When the Senate and the Dean of Students were presented with this policy that they had in fact asked for, they decided to devalue the expert voices of students and the labor that had been put into into the creation of the policy and undertook the writing of their own policy. By the end of 2016, the McGill Senate passed its own policy that legislated that was legislated by the provincial government. It does not corp incorporate the concerns of students and it does not look anything like the draft students made, nor is it a standalone policy. In the spring of 2018, the McGill Students Union published an open letter to the administration calling for an external investigation into the Faculty of Arts handling of sexualized violence complaints against faculty and better involvement of student leadership and expertise in all anti-violence work on campus. Over 2,800 students 100 campus groups and 150 professors signed on in their support of this letter. The only response the student union received for a week 
is an official letter from the provost to one single student leader telling her that she should know better. Approximately a thousand McGill and Concordia students walked out of class during an exam period that season to protest McGill's silence and Concordia's inaction. When the institution continued to ignore the voices of students and their allies, students reported McGill to the Minister of Education to be in violation of the legislated Bill 151, which governs sexualized violence policies in, in the province. The minister's office responded to this by telling the media that they trust McGill to do the right thing with no official response to the students. And as of this presentation, none of the student demands have been met. During this time, what was then our turn organized and was founded um, by organizers who were deeply involved in the McGill and Carlton protests and were further connected to other students doing this work through the publication of the Our Turn National Action Plan, which is a national strategy and toolkit for student groups across Canada to implement pro-survivor policy and to address sexualized violence on their campuses. And as just one component of our work, members of SFCC and student leaders across the country are engaging with consultation processes at multiple levels of governance from the institutions to the federal government. Now, it's very obvious from our experiences of our team and our allies that administration, the government, and student survivors have a foundationally different understanding of what consultation is and could be. And even in conversation with members of the team leading up to this presentation, we noted that it was apparent to us from our experiences that such governments and institutions do not seem to care about meaningful consultation and in instead consider to continue and continue to consider it just a checkbox. The kinds of institutional betrayal that many of us have experienced have in fact made these consultation processes into a social poison on our campuses. On the next slide, we, um, we can come to know that there is a critical analysis of how our student knowledges and experiences become incorporated or not, highlighting post-secondary structures fraught with power imbalances. Members of our organization and certainly beyond have been a part of consultation processes within institutions and governments in which we have contributed our own subjectivities, emotional labor and hopes for something better for us and our fellow students. Only to see our ideas not properly attributed to us, used in ways that are not useful to our communities, or minimized in favor of professional perspectives that may not even be relevant to the context of our post-secondary student experiences. In other words, those undertaking consultation processes, such as administrations and government, are commodifying our knowledges, using them at will to support their own agendas and support the status quo, and often rendering any tools, policies, or practices that come from consultation unusable to the students who have contributed their labors. So all of that amounts to just a very cursory identification of the issues and the experiences that we have experienced um, at Students for Consent Culture Canada. But it's really important to think about the ways that we can begin to shift this. And I want to point out here that it is not the students who need to do the work of shifting. Despite these experiences, we are continuing to show up and use our voices and has been and will be described throughout this webinar. This is what we feel at SFCC is needed to begin the meaningful incorporation of student engagement. And I would further like to acknowledge that what I'm about to speak to here comes mostly from the deep knowledges and experiences of Indigenous communities who I've been engaged with um, or who I know have been engaged in corrupted consultation processes for decades. So it's with acknowledgement of the diversity of knowledges um, that I bring this forward today. So the first thing that I would like to point out is the consideration of language regarding consultation versus collaboration. The language of consultation is rife with power imbalances in which a professional person is seeking information that is useful to them from a certain body of people. Whereas collaboration acknowledges that we all have expertise to contribute as well as a shared responsibility and accountability for a common goal. Within this context, this includes bringing students into the conversation early to set goals, create frameworks and questions, and be part of the analysis incorporation of what was shared in the process. 
This collaborative process allows space for knowledge to be relational, fluid, and emergent, rather than confined by what administrators feel is useful at the time. So I've set this up as a learning to do and unlearning. Um, so let's first take a look at, at what it is that we need to learn. Um, so student run processes. At Vancouver Island University, and as we saw in the McGill and Carleton examples that I presented earlier, students have proven that they can run thoughtful and accountable consultation processes that result in rigorous recommendations for policies and practices. This can take place through already existing structures of equity seeking groups such as women's collectives, indigenous peer groups, or accessibility caucuses, as well as through campus wide town halls. Not only does this distribute power, but also allows for groups to gather information in ways that are culturally located or appropriate to the needs of that community. This student led engagement also extends the reach of consultation beyond students unions who may not actually have experience in anti violence work and those who are more prone to show up. Institutions have the responsibility in these student run groups to ensure that the initiatives are supported in ways that the group determines is appropriate, which may be funding or emotional supports. This will require unlearning the tendency to disregard student experiences, labor and expertise. Students taking part in designing and implementing consultation processes are performing what is often deeply gendered emotional labor and institutions need to be considering how this labor is to be acknowledged and respected. By embracing these student run processes and learning to value knowledges and labor will also ensure that these processes create policies, tools and education programs that are usable and relevant to students on campus. Now, in terms of learning to do, um, this idea of student run processes also weaves itself quite easily into thinking about how these conversations can be ongoing. If the only time an institution is doing consultation is around the time of a policy review, it is failing. Many students may only be at an institution for two to three years before moving on, meaning that you are missing a whole generation of student voices by sticking to a review process and consultation process. By having ongoing opportunities for dialogue embedded within campus culture, we can have a thorough understanding of what our communities are experiencing beyond the limited range of what we are currently seeing. And this correlates to one thing our institutions need to unlearn, a need to create structures that eliminate what we have seen as rush jobs, which are consultations performed on a short timeline that do not allow students to be prepared to engage properly or for what is contributed to be thoughtfully considered and incorporated into the actions of the institution, whether that be policy making or educational opportunities. Another thing to learn is considering how you will use that information and making that a part of your process of consultation. If you're gathering information from students, it is so important to think about how you're going to be accountable to the labor you are asking students to do. Will the result be useful to students? How will you determine if it's useful? How transparent can you make your processes of gathering and using the knowledges and experiences of students? And what mechanisms do you have for student feedback and change? So as we discussed earlier regarding consultation versus collaboration, knowing what student goals are in participating in these processes can help determine what final products of the process can and should be. And this is super easy because the students will literally tell you. And the last thing to unlearn is the idea that these consultation processes are an obligatory checkbox. I literally cannot say it enough that we need to unlearn the idea that we do consultation to meet policy or legislative needs. The knowledges and experiences of our communities are more than a checkbox. These processes must be genuine and conducted with integrity and in good faith with the intent to create real and meaningful change for students experiencing violence and in working towards eliminating violence on our campuses. 
So SFCC was born out of the lack of meaningful student consultation occurring at Carleton, McGill, and what we knew to be in other institutions across the country. Addressing this is deeply important as we believe that authentic student engagement through participation with their institutions is necessary to reduce campus sexualized violence and in supporting for survivors. For too long, those in the anti-violence movements on campuses have felt that they have had to fight against their institutions. From the student perspective, administration is frequently viewed as upholders of the status quo and protectors of the institution's reputation, rather than our allies seeking to support students and our work. We have to fight to be in spaces where our supports are discussed and push back when our voices fail to make it into policy revisions. And we deserve something better than that. We need to believe that our institutions have our backs when it comes to ending violence. And what I have discussed here in this very short time frame is foundational change to consultation processes that could breathe life and student experiences into processes that directly feed policies, procedures, and educational practices that are about us. So moving forward from this, I encourage everyone here to look into the work that the SFCC has which includes a number of policy recommendations, reports, toolkits, and research projects. You can find us through our website here as well as follow us on social media. We definitely have a lot to work to do and we would love to do this work together. So please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Chantel. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Priya Dubey, and I am speaking to you today from Ottawa. I'd like to begin with just a little bit about me. So I graduated from McGill University two years ago. Since then, I worked at an advocacy organization called the Canadian Alliance of Student Associations, or CASA, and I currently work at a government relations firm called SUMA Strategies. Today, I will be talking about my experience in student advocacy um, as it relates to the prevention of sexual violence on campus. I will share key learnings from my experiences at McGill, working on the Student Union's Gendered and Sexual Violence Policy, or GSVP, and my work in federal advocacy through CASA. So my journey in advocacy began when I got involved in supporting the development of the GSVP at McGill. To provide some background without completely repeating what Chantal has already shared, the GSVP came as a student-led response to major gaps and shortcomings in the current policy infrastructure to respond to sexual violence on campus. It was not a standalone policy, even though it was on a separate paper, like has already been mentioned, um, still uh, and that required that the complaint process be carried out through the Student Code of Conduct, which is the general disciplinary code for campus, making the offense no more severe than, say, for example, an infraction of academic integrity. A major focus of the policy from our team's perspective was to design a process that was survivor-centric and easy for students to navigate. Key elements included centralizing resources in one place so a student wasn't required to go on a wild goose chase to find the information they needed. Another was having clear and transparent timelines. With a background in student government, previously serving as the speaker, I assisted the team at McGill, led by Caitlin Silvino, who had led the development of the Our Turn report that Chantel had talked about, and B. Khalili, a passionate advocate and representative from the Student Sexual Assault Support Center. Um, my primary role was to help the team understand how to fit this new policy coming out of the Students' Union into the current governance landscape of the Student Union and McGill. Today I'd like to share some highlights from our process to give folks a sense of how we approach the development of the policy. Our process began by learning the history of sexual violence on McGill's campus. From this, we led several open and closed consultations with many members of the communi campus community. I echo everything Chantal shared about consultation. And one thing I would add from my experience, which I will elaborate upon in my key learning slide, is the challenge of engaging the broader student body in the advocacy process. However, as you can also see from my slides and um, what Chantal has already mentioned, the same year the work was going on, a walkout was organized to hold the administration to account. And I was surprised to see a massive turnout of students. I really felt it was a transformative moment for the campus. Um, and help to engage way more students in the process. 
something I didn't necessarily see happen during the consultations where the turnout was sometimes low. Another interesting note to share about the walkout, uh, Chantel mentioned that professors um, signed a letter. So many professors signed a letter in support of the students' advocacy at the time, uh, to which many students wrote back to professors thanking them for taking a stand, something the professors thought was a coordinated effort by the students. However, it really was just an honest, honest exchange at a time that was opening the way for what I hoped was large scale change on campus. This all was also happening amidst the backdrop of the Me Too movement. Finally, the process concluded with a report and an implementation guide, both resources that will be sent around after for your reference, should they be of interest. A major guiding force of the entire project was the Our Turn report and Caitlin's leadership in developing the policy at McGill. So I'd like to take a moment in this presentation to give her a huge shout out for her efforts and advocacy as well as Connor Spencer, who was the elected representative at SMU, the Students' Union at McGill, who led the charge for change on campus. Without their efforts, this policy and report would not exist today. Moving to the next slide. Uh, now I'd like to speak a little bit about my work at CASA. Um, CASA is an advocacy organization that lobbies the federal government on behalf of post-secondary students across the country. The year I joined CASA in 2018, the federal government invested 5.5 million to the status of women Canada to develop a national framework to respond to gender-based violence on post-secondary campuses. This opened the way for greater advocacy at the federal level in the realm of sexual violence prevention. A central aspect of CASA's advocacy as an organization was the production of policy papers, such as the shared perspectives paper you see on the screen, and organizing lobby weeks. CASA's standing policy on sexual violence prevention included a call for increased data collection at the federal level, being an organization devoted to federal advocacy. Uh, this data collection includes uh, Statistics Canada surveys on the rates of sexual violence on Canadian campuses, which is critical for informing policy response. The other major ask that students brought to the Hill in 2018 was to have the framework, which I previously mentioned in the budget investment, to be made into a standard through the Standards Council of Canada to give it greater force and effect on campus. A central concern that many students had was that administration would not comply with the framework and more forceful compliance mechanisms were needed given the prevalence of mishandled cases across the country. It was through CASA that I participated in the development of the framework and courage to act for it, where I specifically participated um, on the group focused on supports for students. Here, I feel it is necessary to pause and to give thanks to all the students those attending the webinar today, and those who have been involved and continue to be involved in advocacy on the ground um, and continue to lead this very important movement on their campuses. CASA as an organization will always hold a special place in my heart as a living example of Margaret Mead's quote, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Although I'd say it was kind of a big group, but still. All right, moving on to the next slide. Um, now I'd like to wrap up my session by sharing some key learnings, both from my time at McGill and at CASA. As a student at McGill, I mentioned the challenge I encountered in terms of engaging the broader student body. I think all student advocates face this challenge to a certain degree. The fact that a large portion of your student body is either unaware or disconnected from much of the work being done to transform campus culture, including eradicating rape culture on campus. I learned to channel that discouragement in, um, instead into creative action and strategically engage broader networks of students. Students on campus are organized in a myriad of ways, such as res life, sports teams, clubs and societies, and faculties, just to name a few. Using those channels to increase engagement is a surefire way to broaden the reach of your advocacy on campus. The second key learning relates to finding champions within the administration. I mentioned how heartwarming the exchange was between professors and students when professors stood up to be a voice for students on campus. It taught me that the engagement process with administration doesn't necessarily have to be fraught. Rather, it is possible to cultivate spaces for productive dialogue and find champions on campus who are committed to transforming the student experience for the better and building safer communities. Seeking out and working with the champions is key. 
Lastly, I saw huge efforts during my time as a student um, to initiate large scale change at large scale education projects intended to inspire campus wide change. Two such examples I'd like to share today. The first is one that Caitlin, our team lead, um, brought in the policy development process uh, from her experience at Carleton. So the practice was to have all student clubs undergo consent training before being given access to student club status perks like room bookings or club funding, recognizing each campus organizes um, their clubs a little bit differently. That's just an example. But having all clubs undergo training reaches a large portion of students. Another change spearheaded by one of my friends named Amanda Hills was to ensure all first year students participating in FROSH or O Week watch a video about consent before being registered for orientation, a week that is commonly known as the red zone, where a high number of sexual assaults occur. These system wide change initiatives are examples of bringing education that inspires campus wide change. On to the next slide. My experience at CASA broadened my understanding of the various avenues for affecting the kinds of changes we wish to see as student advocates. It taught me to better understand the importance of provincial and federal advocacy. Provincially, there are several policies requiring post-secondary institutions to develop standalone sexual violence policies. The interactions between the government and administrative response is a very important one for students to understand and to continue to push for, which includes compliance to the provincial legislative requirements for proper policies and procedures on campus, as well as sustainable funding for support and prevention services on campus, often something that's the first to go when budget cuts occur. Federally, the framework is a, re a revolutionary step in a positive direction. It's a national recognition that standardization and best practices for prevention, response, and support are desperately needed in Canada. It's also a first attempt to build something of that nature, but student voices in that process are essential. It must always be reflective and connected to the reality on the ground. Thus far, I'd say the framework process has been good at ensuring student voices are present in the conversation, but that must continue to remain a priority and student advocates currently on the ground must be reflected in the continued development of the framework. So understanding the work being done at these levels of government and the avenues for engagement, but most importantly, the power and importance of your voice at the table is also an essential learning I wish to share from my advocacy experience with you folks today. So with that, I We'll move to the next slide. Um, I have left here my personal contact information. Uh, so if you have any questions, please do uh, please get in touch. I've also left the information of uh, CASA since that was the organization through which I did a lot of this work. You'll find the ED and chairs emails here as well. Um, a wonderful student organization to also get in touch with um, if you have any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Priya and Chantel. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm really excited to be here today. My name is Kat, and I am currently the president for the Ontario Undergraduate Student Alliance, um, although I am in my final hours as I'm going to be chairing our election just following this webinar. So I'm really exciting, excited to be finishing up my term um, doing a presentation on something that I'm so passionate about. So USA represents over 150,000 students across Ontario. And we're very much a student driven organization, meaning that all of our advocacy is written and ratified by students um, like potentially yourself if you're on the call um, before they're advocated to at the provincial level. Um, so my plan for the day is going to be walking you through um, some of USA's advocacy efforts, some of the solutions that we've proposed at the provincial level what this means when they're on campus from an implementation point of view um, and some direction um, for where we should be going next. Um, so many of the recommendations that I'm going to be talking about either came from our previous iteration of our gender-based violence prevention and response policy paper or our new one which we actually just published last week. So I'd encourage you to check that out as well. Alrighty, before I get started so we can switch to the next slide. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how I got here. Um, so as you can see the, on the photo, the furthest to the left, um, that's myself and a few of my friends in my second year when I was a residence advisor. 
And during my time as a residence advisor, I, I witnessed and, and supported survivors through um, different policies and procedures within residence life at the university that really weren't survivor centric or trauma informed. And that really sparked um, my passion for getting involved and wanting to make change on my campus. At the same time as this, what, this was happening, um, during a street party on campus or, or outside of campus in a nearby campus neighborhood, there was a bed sheet hung in a camp or a house window that said no means yes, yes means anal, um, which obviously reinforces the campus rape culture that many of us know far too well. Um, so a few friends and myself um, recreated the banner and corrected it and hung it in the middle um, of our university community center atrium in order to provoke a conversation about rape culture on campus and what this means. But no tangible action um, that I could see was really taken over the course of those years. In my third year, um, I took it upon myself as part of my role with the student government to do a pretty comprehensive review of the university's gender-based violence policy. And I worked really closely actually with Connor Spencer, who's a member of Students for Consent Culture. Um, so shout out to SFCC um, for allowing me to do some of that work at the beginning of my advocacy journey um, to talk about where the policy should be headed. And eventually this drove me to run to become the University Students, uh, Students Council Vice President and President of USA so that I could advocate to make stronger policy change um, at both the university but also the provincial level. So now I'll dive into some of those advocacy solutions that USA has been working on. Go to the next slide. Great, so the first one that I wanna talk about is the Sexual Violence and Harassment Action Plan Act, which came out in 2016. USA was heavily involved in consultations with respect to this act, um, and specifically we ad advocated the need for standalone policies and survivor-centric and trauma-informed policy standards. The requirements for data collection um, for a bunch of different things, one of which included in the bill includes that universities have to report back to the ministry with respect to how many sexual harassment and assault complaints happen on an annual basis, and the need for student consultation, which Chantel and Priya have already talked about, um, cannot just be a checkbox. But unfortunately, this continues to differ um, from institution to institution. In a recent survey that our research and policy analysts conducted at USA, we saw that many institutions are really only doing the bare minimum when it comes to survivor centric standards and they tend to match what is outlined in the regulation. So USA has outlined 20 things that we would like to see included in the provincial legislation um, as an amendment to ensure that all of our institutions are following um, what needs to happen in order to ensure that the policies that are in place are actually supporting survivors and they're not re-traumatizing them when they're seeking support or looking to have accountability so that they can continue on their post-secondary journeys. And I think it's also important to recognize um, that student consultation looks different, which I won't dive too deeply into, but it's really, really important that when campus administrators um, are consulting on these types of policies, um, that they're listening the first time that students come forward, recognize that many students involved this, in this work are survivors, um, and therefore do not penalize emotion when it is showed, and to really implement what is being told. I'd like to finish off this slide um, by just calling on a quote that one of my fellow student organizers um, in one of our community of practices at Possibility Seed said that many institutions are anti-sexual violence but not pro-survivor. And I think that when we think about um, the types of policies that are being designed on all of our campuses, oftentimes um, they reinforce accountability um, or liability of the institution, uh, but they all also often do not make it easy um, for people um, to access support um, and to get what they really need and to put the agency back into the survivor's hands. So I'd really encourage you to come back to this quote um, while you're going through the policy processes the next time. So the next advocacy um, item that I want to dive into is the Student Voices on Sexual Violence Survey. This was a policy recommendation USA came up with in 2016 for the need to have a campus climate survey um, as you can see, as I have in really big letters, students have known about the climate on campus um, and highlighted this for decades. We know there's a rape culture that is alive and well, um, but data can be really, really important um, for enforcing advocacy efforts and to ensure that our policies and our programmings reflect the realities on the ground. So um, we advocated for this from 2016 to 2017. There was a survey released in March 2018 
Um, and we advocated for the data, which was released initially, um, a summary in 2019. And this past year, it was one of our primary advocacy objectives to get the full data released, which was released this spring. And it was really key to have all of the data released in order to inform those policy and programming efforts. So I'll give you an example. Priya mentioned the red zone, um, which is the first six to eight weeks of a university student's life are the most risky for experiencing um, or perpetrating um, gender based and sexual violence. Um, so Western University, where I hail from, has really high rates of sexual violence on campus, um, as per this survey but we actually had really low proportional rates for the red zone. So in designing those policies and programmings going forward, it's gonna be really key um, that we're using those lessons. The other thing that we're continuing to ask for is that this survey needs to be repeated every three years so that we can understand what are we doing right, what are we doing wrong, um, and to allow us to have some idea of further direction. Great, so stemming from the student voices on sexual violence, um, this also caused the government to increase the funding for the Women's Campus Safety Grant um, on a one-time basis. So I'm gonna dive into that now on the next slide. Great. So last year when the initial data was released, um, the Campus Safety Grant was doubled um, on a one-time basis. So again, one of our objectives this year um, was to fight for um, sustainable multi-year funding, recognizing that we can't have trans transformative change um, if we only have a one year increase. Uh, many of the most transformative change was, is education and that needs to be happening year after year after year. Um, we can't put investments in, in one time posters and expect there to be dramatic changes on campus. I think it's also important for us to recognize that funding must be sustainable and it also should not be political. So we can't be cutting the funding um, of sexual assault centers and giving um, tokenary bonuses to universities and expect there to be transformative change. I'll also say that it's really important that institutions are putting their money where their mouth is. Um, now that there is um, an increase in money that can be targeted directly to gender-based violence, um, given the context right now where a lot of institutions are facing fiscal austerity, I can understand why it may make sense to try and use um, other funds um, to finance different areas. Um, but if we're going to have change, we need to be reinvesting in this area. We cannot be doing some fun accounting mathematics um, now that there's a little bit more government money headed towards this. Um, and it's really important um, that we also ensure that the staff doing this work are well compensated, recognizing that they're all, often contract staff and on precarious contracts. The other part of this work um, was that we expanded the terms of reference, um, or we fought for that to include salaries. And this is really important, recognizing that oftentimes the most transformative work is education, um, and we need experts to be doing that work. But it will be very important um, to ensure who is deciding and that this funding is being held accountable. So USA is going to be continuing to be advocating um, that there be an annual report with regards to where this funding and the allocations are going. And also the gender-based violence offices, those are the experts on our camp campus, have the autonomy to decide where that funding goes. The last advocacy objective that I want to dive into briefly is the Safe Night Out Act, which is on the next slide. Um, and this is an act that we worked in close collaboration with MPP Sattler um, to have Smart Serve include bystander intervention training. And in our newest iteration of the policy, we also um, have it include um, expanding the security guard syllabus, recognizing that it's often the security guards that need to be the ones intervening, um, and also having policies at bars and restaurants. Because we know that students are experiencing violence on campus, absolutely, but they're also experiencing it off campus, oftentimes where there's alcohol. And therefore, if we want to be preventing the incidences that are happening, we need to be thinking about the spaces and places where violence is happening. So those are four of the solutions that USA has been advocating for over the past few years. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, as you can see on the left, this is the table of contents um, of our most recent policy paper. It's 70 pages long, so we have a lot more work to do. Um, and I really encourage everyone on this call today um, to work collaboratively. Um, we have a lot of recommendations here that are provincially oriented, um, but a lot of these can be implemented as best practices on your campus. So I really encourage you to do that. Elevate student voices. Oftentimes students um, are frustrated, they're belittled when they try and give criticism. So hear their feedback and elevate it if you have power. 
um, and read our research and our reports. Like I mentioned, USA and lots of students who are survivors have put labor into this. Um, try and implement those best practices, but also SFCC, CASA, CFS, we all have best practices that we are fighting hard to have implemented. And I really encourage you to take it upon yourselves if you are in a position of power to do so, to implement that. Um, thank you so much. And I will turn it over to Trina. Oh, and that's me. Um, so like I mentioned, I am done my term with USA today. So if you have any questions that you want to get um, to me directly, that's my personal contact, um, or you can reach out to USA directly. Okay, well, thanks so much, Kat, Priya, Chantel. I feel like very excited to be on this, um, this panel and be able to talk to you folks about the importance of campus education, specifically when it's talking about consent and um, gender-based violence. So if we go to the next slide, just a little introduction about myself. So I am a former representative from the Canadian Federation of Students. I used to be the treasurer there, like folks heard in the introductions. Um, through the Canadian Federation of Students, they do have a variety of different campaigns that are, talk about um, consent organizing, such as our No Means No Consent is Mandatory campaign. Um, our organization as well as all the organizations on the call have also played a heavy role when it comes to lobbying at the federal and provincial level, specifically in the province of Ontario. Um, a lot of the lobbying efforts led to um, the impl implementation of mandatory sexual assault policy. So we see the fact that student leaders have continued and will continue to be the leaders around this topic. Um, and then at the federal level, we've seen a lot more work done specifically through um, wage and the creation of this framework and which I've been very um, I guess privileged to be a part of. But I feel like um, a lot of my specific organizing when it comes to gender-based violence very much happened when I was on my campus at the University of Toronto Scarborough campus where I was um, VP Campus Life but more specifically when I did a lot of organizing around orientation as orientation coordinator. Um, it was during this time that I felt that there is an urge or a need to kind of shift, um, not just by myself, but by a lot of student leaders on campus, the types of education that would be happening on campus around consent. Um, so the next slide outlines these two facts. I like to say these are two not so fun facts when we're talking about gender-based violence. Um, the first one is actually one that is pulled directly from the framework that was developed. Um, and that one states that 41% of all reported incidents of sexual assault were reported by students. So we're knowing that students are the ones who are oftentimes coming forward um, reporting incidents of sexual assault. What's extremely alarming with this number is that this number is actually not inclusive of the countless amount of people who are disclosing on campus. Now, the second um, stat, one that was often referenced in the presentations prior also known as the red zone was the one that fired myself up and I would argue fires a lot of student leaders up on campus when it's time for orientation and it's that fact that most incidents around sexual assault on campus happens within the first two months of the fall semester also known as the red zone and I feel like this is why at least when I did my time at um, University of Toronto Scarborough campus why we tend to prioritize a lot more consent based programming and education throughout um, the duration of orientation programming. On the next slide, um, this is where we kind of map out some of the consent-based and gender-based um, education that we did during orientation. So to start off, if you were a person who wanted to participate in our orientation, whether as a volunteer, as a part-time staff, as well as our full-time staff, they all had to take place in mandatory training. So at minimum, they had an understanding of what consent was and the resources that were available either on campus or around the campus community. In addition to that, we also did a variety of different consent-based um, programming throughout the duration of orientation week, as well as ensure that the orientation kits that many first year students got had information around the various resources that are available on campus, as well as um, materials talking about safe sex. Because oftentimes when talking about consent, I feel like as I've done consent work, not just within the realm of students, but outside of it, um, the biggest complaint that I've heard is that it's a very much of a triggering topic, which it is, but there are unique ways in which you can incorporate consent-based programming by talking about safe sex and safe um, sex positive way. 
One thing that we, I noticed when I was an executive um, at my students union, so during my time as VP Campus Life, that oftentimes the conversations around consent and gender-based programming that happened on my campus would end after orientation. Um, but if we as a people recognize that in order for us to combat um, rape culture within our society, we need to do more. Um, we tried our best to incorporate um, consent-based programming in all aspects of programming that happened on campus. So this leads us beautifully into the next slide um, where we have a, we saw a lot more consent-like programming happening on our campus. And I would argue a lot of these programmings or staple events tend to happen on campuses across this country. Some of the staple ones that we often hear about are the vagina monologues, Take Back the Night, for example, um, with the Canadian Federation of Students, one thing that they've hosted in the past and was actually getting ready to host um, earlier this winter semester is the Consent Culture Forum. So a space for students to inform themselves on issues around consent as well, just like learn more about what consent looks like. Other things that we did on our campus too was try to find fun and unique ways of engaging or talking about consent-based materials in other spaces that you probably wouldn't do it. So one thing that we did a lot on my campus was ensure that all of the bars that were on campus had um, consent-based programming and materials within it, which is something you see at, on campus student-led pubs across this country. So we know this is something that student leaders have deemed as a priority priority and ensuring that spaces in which we typically have seen situations around this topic happen, ensuring that there's programming and messaging outlining the basis, understanding of what um, everyone is supposed to be leading by. And then I think another cool example of fun programming that tends to happen on different campuses and kind of ties into this idea of when we're talking about consent, a unique way or cool way of engaging with it is by taking it through a very sex positive approach by hosting things like sex positive or sexy trivia and bingo. So that's like the middle picture there and I really love it. This is an event that happens every year at the University of Windsor actually um, during their orientation week. Now, I feel like this begs a big question, um, and the big question will actually happen on the next slide. Now, is this enough? And to be honest, it really isn't. This is a start. Well, all these events, these programming, these educational things, um, campaigns that are being developed by students are examples of how students have recognized that there's an issue that's happening on campuses or on their campus, and they're doing what they can within their capacity to meet that need. In addition to that, what all of these events, programmings, campaigns that have been happening across the country on campuses are examples of how students are filling in the gaps and providing in ways they feel their administration just has not. Um, one thing it's also important to recognize that though many of the campuses on the call may have a variety of different resource centers that are available to, to students, None of this actually matters if a student is unaware of the process when it comes to reporting or disclosing, is unaware of the, avail the services that are available to them, or doesn't actually fully understand the basic understanding around consent. So the clear gap here is not the fact that a service is not available, but the fact that education on the topic is just not clear until the situation arises, which I would argue is way too late. So, now I'm offering the next solution. So what are the next steps when it comes to how administrators can adequately support campus education when it comes to consent and gender-based violence? And I have a very simple answer for all of you that will be shown on the next slide. Mandatory training for everybody. This includes faculty, this includes staff, this includes upper administration. Every single person who is a part of your campus community needs to be trained on the basic understanding of consent um, across the board. And we've seen um, programs like this happen at different campuses. I know McGill has recently implemented their own um, mandatory sexual violence training. I would argue that the only reason why um, a campus like McGill had to or felt like implementing it. It stems from the years of work being done by students and unpaid labor being done by students around this topic um, in order for them to implement this. In other provinces, we've seen them develop different training modules for people. So like in my home where I'm living right now in Halifax, um, also known as um, um, in Nova Scotia, they have a 
break the cycle um break the silence sorry module that is created and it has a variety of different modules for uh, any person to um, go through that outlines conversations around consent it also has different set um, modules that talk about indigenous issues as well as the issues being faced by African Nova Scotia it's recognizing that people of color and indigenous people face some of the highest rates of gender based violence in this country. Um, so we know that there's standards that have been set. Um, on the next slide, I've kind of outlined different things that all of your consent based training should be inclusive of. So at minimum, we should be talking about what consent is. It should be outlining the resources that are available on your campus, as well as it should be outlining what the processes look like. These are all examples of education so that when a student interacts with the situation, if a student discloses or wants to report um, to a faculty staff or the appropriate measures, we all have an understanding of what consent is, the resources available, and what the process is gonna look like. If you're an administrator or a staff person on this call who feels like campus safety, campus health are something that's integral to ensuring that students are able to access the best safe um, experience when it comes to the academia, you should also be agreeing that having access to education around gender-based violence falls under that because it will it will increase campus health and also it will increase um, campus safety as well as increase the pr overall academic productivity of students that are attending that campus. Another thing I think it's important to note when we're talking about campus um, education, which folks can see on the next slide, is that we need to ensure that our campus education is reflective and catered to the wide variety of needs, um, as well as um, reflects the needs of a lot of the vulnerable groups. So I mentioned this before, Indigenous people, Black folks, and students of color are often face some of the highest rates of gender-based violence, whether it's on or off the campus. People, with living, people who are living with disabilities, people from a variety of different religious and cultural backgrounds, queer and trans people, are all people whose experiences, whose needs need to be reflected in the education-based training that we're providing. Um, if you're a person, once again, who works for or are often a person who interacts with a specific um, service that your university provides, um, I, within the work that I've done, not just around the top topics of consent, many of the issues that students have um, expressed is that when they're accessing services, they often face forms of racism, homophobia, transphobia, Islamophobia, and the list goes on. And when we're thinking about that from the lens of a survivor, if I'm a survivor, the last thing that I want to deal with when accessing a resource when it comes to getting resources to help me through my new situation with this situation that has now arise, looking for academic support, the last thing a person is going to want to deal with is the isms or the phobias that are based in the ignorance of staff people. So it's important that when we're doing this training around consent and education, that we're highlighting the unique experiences of this um, group of people because too many times have our experiences have been left out of the conversations around gender-based violence. And this is why so many people from this populace of people or group of people tend to not go through the route of reporting or even go through the extent of disclosing with people, disclosing to people on campus. But I think that leads beautifully into my final thoughts when we're talking about um, campus education, um, at, which is outlined on the next slide. So if you are an administrator who feels like you want to prioritize campus education, I would start off by, if you haven't already, reviewing the Courage to Act framework. Here outlines everything when it comes to situations around policy, adequate collaboration with students on campus. Um, I would argue if you joined the call but didn't even review the, the framework, it's kind of like showing up to lecture without doing the readings. You've done half the work and I strongly encourage you all to take our new, I would argue, um, structure of our world with the pandemic happening to take the time to read the, this framework. There was a lot of work, a lot of heart and soul put into the framework and it would be a shame for it to not be actually implemented and put to use. So if you folks love the things that we're saying, a lot of it's already outlined in that framework. So take the time to review it. Um, 
reminder that your campus education should be mandatory and it should also be continuous just because you are a staff person who did your consent based training back in 2008 or back in 2019 doesn't mean that you're absolved of that training for this year it's something that you should also um, should be mandatory every single year for every single staff person and also ensure that your education is inclusive of the experiences of all people, um, not just the lens that we tend to talk about when we're talking about gender-based violence. Oftentimes it comes through a very um, cis women lens, which I understand to an extent, but through doing that, you very much exclude the experiences of people coming from queer relationships, people who are trans identified, people who are um, a person of color and people living with disabilities. So that's all I have for you. Great, thank you, Chantelle, Priya, Kat, and Trina. I know we're at the one hour mark, but if everyone um, is able to stay with us a few minutes longer, together we can pose some questions um, and comments to our speakers. And you can do so by typing these into the question and answer box at the bottom of your screen. Oh, lovely. So I see that we already have a few um, in our Q&A box. Um, so our first question um, is, as we navigate shifting resources and supports online due to COVID-19, are there areas that we should specifically focus on to ensure that students facing gender-based violence are not falling th through the cracks created by distance, since so much support is usually face-to-face? -face? So I'll leave that to any of our four speakers um, to answer. Thanks for the question. Um, I can pop pipe in and feel free for any of the other panelists to supplement it. Um, obviously, we're hearing a lot about domestic violence, particularly in COVID-19. And I think it's going to be really key that our gender based violence offices are thinking about how can they virtually support um, whether that looks like are they creating information and educational awareness um, for even different students and peers potentially of people who may be um, facing domestic violence so that they can intervene. Um, helping when possible to do virtual or phone appointments, recognizing that we know that many of our sexual assault centers are at capacity right now. Um, and then also I think about um, creating uh, virtual um, safe communities um, for members of the LGBTQ um, plus community, recognizing that lots of our students are also facing family violence right now um, if they're living with homophobic or, or transphobic families. So it'll be really important that those safe spaces are created and that we're supporting our students who also might be feeling with facing additional stressors right now. I would definitely agree with Kat on that. This is Chantal, by the way. Um, and I think that it's also important to note that even before COVID-19 and when supports were being delivered face-to-face, -face, that there were still people falling through the cracks. And that this just, high, as it does in so many other issues um, that we're seeing right now, this is really just highlighting inequalities and barriers that were already in existence. Um, and I hope that whatever methods we develop to support survivors um, right now continues to exist outside of COVID-19, recognizing that there, there are a multitude of barriers that people have to face in gaining supports, but I think that really creating these digital networks, I know from the disability justice community, I've been to, I've been present for so many webinars and so many great conversations about like, why is it only now that we're thinking about creating online communities of practice and communities of support for folks. Um, so yeah, I, I would like to point out that this needs to be part of like a web of understanding and support for people that continues well beyond this. Great, thank you, Kat. Thank you, Chantal. Um, our next question for all of you is what about college students and how can these strategies be modified for students who are often only um, in school really for one to three years? I suppose that's more around um, the education piece. I feel like some of the strategies like um, conversations around mandatory um, training for all students uh, as well as faculty and staff are something that could work well for college students specifically. I also feel like um, with the setup of many college campuses, it could create the opportunity to create at least from the student's line, I feel like I'm more talking from the student's line here, unique 
um, points of engagement to talk uh, to educate college students around consent. I feel like from the administrative lens, the administrators themselves should be taking a more intense onus to inform students on the various processes around um, gender-based violence as well as like the resources that are available to them because it always goes back to the big no that for a lot of students they don't know about these resources or things available to them until this a situation arises or until it's too late and then recognizing that for the average college students a program is lasting anywhere between 18 months to two years um, they're learning about this situation at a short or learning about these resources if anything at a shorter rate or when it's too late or towards the end of their term. So um, always, I guess it falls very much back on administrator being very proactive and ensuring that we're finding places to engage with college students um, as soon as they get on our campuses around conversations of consent. I'd like to weigh in also on the college um, question. It's Priya here. Uh, I, re I recall from CASA time, some of uh, our college ad uh, student advocates would share um, one particular aspect of like a college student experience sometimes is more work placements or more um, like you have more uh, transition between your campus environment and then your workplace environment. So being very cognizant of that and having the proper, um, you know, protections and prevention um, in place so that you're sending students into workplaces where they are safe and that the, the university um, recognizes the responsibility that they have to make sure that their students are safe in those workplaces. So that I would say is like a unique piece um, to colleges. I know universities also have work uh, workplace dynamics, but I think uh, I remember hearing it more so in college environment. And the other I would say is um, we've spoken a lot about education in, in clubs, for example, and like campus wide education, but in smaller college settings, where um, the campus community is dynamic in the sense, sometimes students are off at work placement, um, or in trades, for example, reaching students directly in the classroom. So having those trainings um, be part of your classroom training is another um, novel approach that that could be considered to, to adapt to college environments. Perfect. Thank you, Trina, and thank you, Priya, as well. Um, so I'm just a little mindful of time, and uh, perhaps we'll end with um, some of the comments, actually, in, in the chat box. And um, some of our attendees wanted to say thank you so much to all of you for all the work that you do and all the info. It's really exciting to hear about it, and uh, it's what keeps everyone fired up. So thank you. Um, Yes, and so we've had a wonderfully engaging, informative, and um, thought-provoking discussion today. So thank you so much again, Chantel, Trina, Priya, and Kat. And uh, thank you for sharing your time and your expertise with us today. We've learned a lot. And the recording, um, as well as the transcript, will be available on our website in a few days. Um, and I also want to thank our participants for joining us and uh, sharing with us today. We appreciate and take a lot of inspiration from your commitment to addressing and preventing gender-based violence on campus. And uh, we're very lucky to be able to work alongside each and every one of you. So thank you again, and um, a kind reminder to please complete the evaluation forms. And um, we'll see you at the next webinar in June. Thank you, everyone.